We are live. Okay. I'm here. Hi, Lisa. Are you able to share your video? <laughs> I am. I am. I keep hitting start video. <laughs> oh, you want to make sure before I... Uh... I know. Before we reveal ourselves with our amazing Zoom backgrounds and... Yeah, mine says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. Oh. Hmm. Let's see if CJ can help with that. Now it's starting. There I am. There Woo. you are. <laughs> it's us. <laughs> I literally just walked in the door like five minutes ago because I went for my COVID. Yeah, test. that's great. Yeah. I mean, what a timely aspect of this discussion, right? People going <laughs> off and getting their vaccines. And like hauling ass home to get, <laughs> but it's weird because I actually have real pants on, which I don't think I've, you know, had on for one of these Zoom things in many, many. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, Lisa, <laughs> so what's hilarious is, um, so we are now, all, our, our, after you've said that, which is, I'm just going to start laughing more. We are live on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and also live on the webinar so i don't know we've got 12 people in the participant area so that's exciting i figure that means we should like get to it in terms of me doing an introduction while you prepare yourself so that's totally fine lisa because you've already heard wonderful things about you've lived your own life so me reading about it isn't necessarily something you have to deeply tune into um but i'd like to just welcome everybody to this is our third lecture in the Research in Real Life lecture series, uh, the first of the spring semester. We are so fortunate to have Lisa Middleman joining us today um, from the comfort of her own home. Me, I'm at lovely Cal U, but I've chosen this lovely background <laughs> instead um, to, you know, uh, sort of um, present to all of you a conversation about jury selection. Now, before I introduce Lisa, I just want to kind of connect in on what the purpose of this research series is so folks can think about that as they're posing questions or kind of considering what it is that this, you know, how our content is going to be geared. But we are trying to connect our students at Cal U to the ways in which research can be incorporated into their studies and into the future career paths that they may engage in. So when we have a speaker like Lisa, who's going to talk about you know, some of the process and, and some of today's talk is going to focus specifically on jury selection and some of the processes that are related to research that go into that. Um, you know, what we're really trying to do is have people see how, how practically research is a part of one's life, career, and like everyday activities that they do. Um, so on that note, I'm going to introduce Lisa. I have a lovely bio to read here, and then we'll sort of start our conversation. So Lisa is a career public defender, um, criminal defense attorney, and devoted mother of two who will bring a new perspective to the Court of Common Pleas of Allegheny County. Um, she's a Highland Park native. She graduated from Duke University before returning home to attend the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. While studying law, she worked as a law clerk in the Allegheny County Public Defender's Office and at a firm that handled workers' comp and social security cases. In her third year of law school, she became the full-time chief law clerk for the Public Defender's Office. After passing the bar exam in 1987, Lisa worked in the public defender's office and maintained a small private practice, litigating thousands of cases in courtrooms throughout Pennsylvania. Early in her career, she co-sponsored a study on the racial disparities in jury selection in an effort to ensure more representative jury panels. This was, the, was the, only the beginning of a lifetime of fighting for justice and greater equity in our legal system. For the last 30 years, Lisa has been assigned to the most difficult and complex homicide and death penalty cases, as she is one of Allegheny County's most qualified and respected criminal defense attorneys. Some of her high-profile death penalty cases included Commonwealth versus Alan Wade, Commonwealth versus Richard Poplowski, Commonwealth versus Leslie Mollett, and Commonwealth versus Ronald Taylor. More than two decades ago, Lisa became one of the original union organizers of the attorneys at the Public Defender's Office and has been serving as the grievance officer for many years, representing employees in disciplinary actions. Lisa has also prioritized attending classes and speaking with students at school districts around the region, including Woodland Hills, North Allegheny, 
Avonworth and many Pittsburgh public schools. These visits have afforded her the opportunity to encourage and empower young people to pursue careers in the law and to educate them about that process. She has also been a guest coach and moot court judge at high school and law school moot court competitions. In addition to educating students, Lisa has been an instructor for many attorneys continuing legal education events for the Public Defender's Office and for the University of Pittsburgh and Duquesne University Law Schools. Um, in 2019, Lisa ran for Allegheny County District Attorney and spoke at hundreds of events to engage communities in discussions of fairness, equity, and justice. After the 2020 protests for racial justice, she formed and led a coalition of attorneys to provide pro bono legal services for peaceful protesters who were wrongfully charged. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. We are so lucky to have you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. So I guess, Lisa, not to be like, where do we begin? Because there's many places to begin. But I guess, would you tell us, you know, I've read about, you know, we read about your bio and stuff, but tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of your own, your path to the place. What are the things that encouraged you along the way to choose this career and motivated you in one direction or another? Well, so my dad was a lawyer. He's still alive, but he's in his um, mid eighties now, but he was that old timey kind of lawyer. You know, he, he handled every kind of case and people were coming into his office and I would, I love to go to his office mostly because I like to like play with the adding machine. Cause back then we had actual adding machines and play with all the equipment, but, um, they would come in and they would talk to him and they would leave and they would say thank you and that they they felt so much better and he was resolving you know issues and problems so i always wanted to be a lawyer but i was not sure what my path would be and i worked at the public defender's office and was the chief law clerk there so one of the things that that meant was that i received like post-trial motions or appeals on cases and I would decide which law clerk would handle them because at that time the law clerks did all the work and we handed it off to a lawyer and they signed off on it. So one case came across my desk. I'll never forget. It was Commonwealth versus Timothy Jenkins. And he was an intellectually impaired young man who had been convicted of first degree murder. And the motion that I wrote, because I kept this one for myself, was he he paid an attorney $300. The attorney had a problem with alcohol, didn't call alibi witnesses, didn't explore the chief eyewitness. Um, and so I wrote a motion basically asking for a new trial because his attorney was incompetent. And um, I wasn't allowed to argue the motion because I wasn't a lawyer yet. So I went with the lawyer and watched him argue it before Judge Novak. And he granted this kid a new trial. And that was very rare and it was amazing. And in his second trial, he was appointed a private attorney, um, a very well-known, respected guy named Mike Witherall. And when that jury came back with the not guilty verdict, this giant, I mean, he was giant, this kid was giant. Um, he picked Mike Witherall up and twirled him around in the courtroom because he had basically changed his life. And I saw right then what the difference was between having a good lawyer who actually cared about you and a bad lawyer. Yeah. And I had decided, you know, I had a, my parents provided me with like an incredible education and incredible opportunities. And so I felt compelled to use that, um, all the advantages that I had to try to help people who didn't. So I stayed at the public defenders. Um, I started doing homicide cases in 1992. My very first case was the death penalty sentencing, the death penalty sentencing. Um, and I would love to say that was because I was so skillful at, that people recognized it already, but I suspect that it was because I was hugely pregnant at the time. Uh, <laughs> and it was a very good optic to stand in front of a jury, you know, asking for life. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. I, yeah, pregnant woman. Um, but that's, that's sort of how I came to be. And the more I, um, the more I worked at the public, well, public defender's office is, is an entity that provides free legal services in criminal cases for people who can't afford, um, an attorney. And usually it's people below the poverty level. Those guidelines change all the time, but most of the people that I've represented have had 
you know, mental health issues, addiction issues, homelessness, joblessness, poverty, trauma. I mean, they are the forgotten people. And so it's been an incredible honor to, to, to be their voice for the last 30 something years. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's so interesting just as a social work professor, you know, when people, the narratives are really what bring people's, not just their story slate, but it's very relatable to somebody else, right? Like this is why they chose the field that they're in. It's, it's something, an experience they've had. And I think part of what we wanted to talk about today was a little bit about jury selection and some of the narratives and experiences you've had and how, you know, your own process for understanding the laws that govern that process what that process practically looks like right now and how maybe it should look or would look in an ideal world. Right. So I guess talk to me more about that, I suppose, is my broader. Well, so what I do in homicide, well, mostly in death penalty cases is I, when I'm trying to, to, to figure out how to organize sort of to just, maybe I should describe the process of jury selection. Yeah, yeah so, that's great. In any criminal case, um, it, you go to a big room, there may be, depending on how many juries would be picked that day, there might be 100, 150 people in the room, there might be 75, you know, just anywhere in that range. And it's sort of like an auditorium. There are two large tables in the front of the room and there's an aisle in the seating area where the audience would be. And the, those spaces are just filled with people who are summoned from voter registration lists and driver's license lists. And they come in and sit and wait. And when a, a group comes in to pick a jury, like the defendant is always entitled to, to be there and his counsel, and then the prosecutor would be there. Um, and we sit down at the table. Back when I first started, um, we received no paperwork except a list of names. So the clerk would call the list of names, you know, he'd clear out five or seven rows and fill them up with about 35 people randomly selected from the randomly selected list. And um, the court clerk would read the charges and ask if anybody had any, you know, physical disability so that they couldn't serve on the jury or if anybody had any important business plans so that they couldn't sit on the jury. And then we would basically go down the list and pick you know, number one, are they acceptable or not acceptable? And because you have a certain number of challenges to the jury panel, you're entitled to challenge certain members of the jury panel. You would have as many challenges as the judge would allow. So, and those are challenges because the person can't be fair and impartial. So if you're doing a robbery case and somebody said, I can't be on the jury because, or I don't want to be on the jury, or I was robbed um, at gunpoint three days ago, that would be a person that the judge would say, okay, that person can't be fair, so they're not going to sit on the jury. But you would also have challenges for absolutely no reason at all. And each side is limited to seven of those on a felony case and five of them on a misdemeanor case. Mm -hmm. So you, the only real way that you had to, to determine whether somebody would be good for your jury or not was to look at them when they read the charges. Huh. You know, and sometimes it was very easy, obviously, you know, I've tried back then, I, you know, I would I'd try like a sex, a child sex assault case and you could see who, you know, did this or I've actually had people cry during the reading of the charges and you would make a little note like that's a hard pass, you know, on, yeah. on that person. Um, but unfortunately, back then we didn't have individual voir dire, which is called individual questioning of jurors. They didn't come up to the table. We didn't have a chance to talk to them. You honestly made your judgments based on what they wore, what they looked like, what books they had, you know, whether they yeah. dressed up for court or not, just things that didn't really matter. So at some point, and I, it was after the mid nineties, and I don't have the exact day for you, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania said, you know, we need to give these attorneys a little bit more information about the people that are coming before them for jury selection. So they put together a questionnaire that has, you know, a little bit of biographical information, how many children you have, what your highest level of education, your spouse, what they do, your, your occupation and general neighborhood. And then there are a list of questions that apply to constitutional rights. Like, do you understand that 
you know, defendant has the right to not testify in any criminal trial? And would you hold that against them if they did? Um, some feeling, some questions about witnesses, like would you tend to believe the testimony of a police officer more than another witness? Or would you be less likely to believe the testimony of a police officer? And they provided for allowing jurors to be questioned individually at the table. And, you know, nobody, it seems like wants to do extra work. So originally when we were picking juries, we would only be allowed to bring people up who had checked yes on one of those questions. Hmm. Yeah that they didn't understand a constitutional right. And then it morphed to allowing everyone to come up so that we would have an opportunity to talk to them. So we went from in the late eighties to early nineties to not asking anybody questions at all, except on murder cases, to now being allowed to actually converse with jurors. And jury selection, there's sort of another tier of jury selection, which is on a death penalty case because the only people that are actually permitted to serve on a death penalty jury are those people who say, yes, I would be willing to impose the penalty of death. So if you are a person who goes to jury selection as a citizen and says, I think the death penalty is wrong, I don't believe in it, you won't sit on the jury. It's a really interesting. Right. That was one, was that one of the questions that was added to that? survey no piece, when you're talking about that. that's a, that's always been a question for death penalty cases that's yeah that's always been a question for death penalty cases and that homicides and death penalty cases were sort of always an exemption to that you can't talk to people individually we've yeah. always been able to do that um the, the it's interesting to me though that you cannot serve if you're mm -hmm. the death penalty. So, so like no Quakers are ever on that kind of a, right? I mean, that's the yeah, worst thing. And so it's a skill that those of us who do that kind of work have to develop because when you're doing the questioning, it's not just, do you believe in it? We have to take this circuitous road to get people to say, you know what? You're right. It might not be my moral ethical choice um, it's not what I believe, but I could follow the law. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, Jury selection becomes less of a, let me just ask a yes or no question. And it becomes trying to take somebody who looks favorable to you as a juror on your case and lead them down the path to giving the correct answers so that they can stay or that. So the other side has to burn one of those strikes that they, those free strikes that they have. So some of it becomes kind of a game as to who can get whom to burn their their strikes down kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. That's always been part of the game is to leave the other side with no strikes so that somebody who is favorable to your side cannot be challenged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny because when I was thinking about this, I thought, wow, this is going to be a really short talk because the short answer for jury selection is it's all a crapshoot. Yeah. yeah. But the long answer is that if you recognize the importance of it, you can really spend a lot of time and effort and energy becoming good at it. And then it is less of a crapshoot. It's more of a deliberate, a deliberate process. And as, you know, from my own curiosity, you know, I think about like, you know, social work as a discipline and like how we in the field, right? Like, I mean, people have internships, of course, and externship experiences in law school. Do you find that a law student coming out would have knowledge of that going into, right? Like work in a public defender's office or would that be something that they really just learned on the on the job in terms of? That, that sort of figuring out who it is that you want and how to get them through jury selection, um, I think is a skill that you have to learn. So a lot of, um, younger lawyers, watch, they come to jury selection and watch how it's done, particularly hmm. death cases, because they are much more involved and, and like, you know, much lengthier. So, yeah. I mean, when I first start, training has changed significantly from when I started as a lawyer. Like when I did my first jury trial, I didn't know where to sit in the courtroom because there's the two, there are two tables. There's a defense table and there's the prosecution table. 
And so I walked in and thought, oh, I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch enough Law and Order before this uh, walking in here. It didn't exist yet. So where do I go, people? <laughs> so I mean, kind of lurked around pretending I was, you know, doing other things. And then finally, I had to walk up to the court reporter and say, hey, I'm new here. Which table <laughs> do I sit at? And so the answer to that question is the prosecutor always gets to sit closest to the jury box. Yeah. And isn't there, not, not, not to like take us off the jury selection piece, but isn't there like an order in which things go to where like the defense doesn't, the prosecution goes last, not the defense? Or like, how does that work? In well, because in a criminal trial, the prosecution has the burden of proof. They get yeah. to speak first, like in opening statements and say what they're going to prove. And then when you do closing arguments at the conclusion of the trial, they get to speak last. Yeah. So it's a skill sort of to anticipate what they're going to say because you don't get any rebuttal. Yeah. And I've, I've actually asked jurors to, to take my role or my place in my closing arguments. You know, I say, I'm not going to get a chance to respond. So please, when you're deliberating and you're talking about the facts and the law, think about what I might say, you know, or what my argument might be. Yeah. I want to um, speak to our audience now, too, for those people who are on YouTube or for those who are in the webinar. If you have questions um, for Lisa, you can post those in the Q&A and I will read them out loud to her so that we can have, you know, I'm sure many of you maybe have specific questions about jury selection process or, you know, um, other things like related to um, a career like Lisa's. I guess, Lisa, I'd like to ask, too, um, you know, when we talked about, you know, when we prepared for this, you know, lecture um, one of the things we talked about was talking about some narrative, like some experiences you've had or stories that you'd like to share. So I'm wondering um, which ones in particular, or if there's one narrative in particular that comes to mind for you when you think about the things you'd like to see change in jury selection of a process that you saw really not go the way. Right. So there are there are some protections in place to try to ensure that the constitutional requirement for a jury of your peers happens. Mm -hmm. But as everybody knows, like the perfect world and the real world, world are often very different. So when, when I first started, I noticed that, and this is, I think this happened all across the country, prosecutors were, um, striking people of color from juries. A lot of the public defender clients are African-American um, and district attorneys would routinely strike black people from juries because they didn't want them to relate to our clients. And there was a case in 1986 called Batson, which precluded um, prosecutors from doing that because it, they, and the reasoning behind it was you're depriving these folks of a fair trial if they can't have a jury that includes black people. But about six years later, the Supreme Court said, nobody can strike people of color. Nobody can um, discriminate in jury selection, not because of the defendant or not because of the prosecution, but because it actually deprives the people um, who come for jury duty you're discriminating against them and it deprives them of the opportunity to participate. But be that as it may, I picked a lot of juries that were all white. And yeah, yeah I would show up for jury selection and look at the room, you know, and just go, God, you know, geez. So we started complaining about it. And it's not just me, it was defense attorneys all across the county. Some judges were good enough to say, you know what, you have an all white panel today, just pick tomorrow or they would um, say, are there any people, any people of color who showed up today for jury duty? Let's pick, let's deliberately put those people in a panel so that you have a fair representation of the community in your panel. And those were things that some judges did, but not all did. So as a result of that, another public defender and I, a guy named Chris Paterini, um, hired, I have to say his name right because he was an amazing guy. He's no longer um, alive, but he was, it was Dr. John Carnes and he was a lawyer, sociologist uh, who was working at um, 
the University of Pittsburgh at the time. And so we designed questionnaires that basically were age, sex, race, and handed them to every single person who showed up for jury duty in six, it was about a six month period. And we had an investigator so that we didn't touch any of the, we weren't involved, physically involved in the process. We had an investigator go every evening and pick those up from the jury room. Mm -hmm. And we, so we gave that data to Dr. Carnes um, and he analyzed it and found, and I'm gonna read this because it's like, I'm, I'm one of those people that understands math and science when I try really hard. <laughs> <laughs> there are many people and many of us many of us lisa i appreciate reading reading for specificity and accuracy is a good thing yeah so he um his conclusions were that although african americans made up 10.7 of the population of allegheny county who were eligible for jury service and that's not even the population, the African American population of the county. It's just those who are eligible for jury service by virtue of being on one of those lists, like a driver's license list or a um, voter registration list. The percentage of African Americans who were actually present in the jury pool who showed up was only 4.87%. So that means that half, over half, of African Americans who were eligible for jury service were excluded from jury service. And so we presented that data in a number of homicide cases. Like every time we had a big case, I would file a motion called um, motion for representative veneer, meaning I want the people I'm picking from to look like the people of Allegheny County. Yeah. And there was a kid, um, his name is Joseph Howes, and, and he was charged with a homicide. He and another kid went to buy dope for or marijuana from a guy in Verona, a white man. My client was black. And I filed one of those motions. The judge denied it. We presented all this data and had Dr. Carnes come in and testify. And the judge said, no, because the law is that unless you can prove that the process is discriminatory, the discriminatory result doesn't matter. So he did not allow us, he didn't give us any, any relief. So we went down to pick the jury, we walked into the room, and of course it was the all white day. So we picked a jury of all white people. And I remember distinctly, and it was so long ago, I feel like it was um, like 2000, and the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, 2004 and I remember walking into the room and sitting down you know getting ready to start the trial and I looked up at the judge and he was a white man he looked over at the prosecution table and it was a white man and a white cop detective and I looked at the jury box and they were full of white people and there was me the white person and I knew all the witnesses in the case were white and I just looked at my client and just, and I thought, I know I've already made all these arguments. So I stood up and before, like I asked to approach the bench and I said, this is outrageous. You know, this is, this kid is sitting in a room where there isn't one person that looks like him. We're like in 1936, Alabama. This is, and so I argued again <clears throat> and the judge still denied um, my request. So we went to trial and Joseph Howe was convicted of, of murder. Yeah. But his, his description of what happened, he said he and this other kid went to buy weed, um, that the kid's brother showed up, that his co-defendant did something, I guess that alarmed the brother, that they pulled guns, everybody pulled guns. And so it was a, a basically a self-defense claim. And he said, I wasn't even the one that shot him. It was my co-defendant. So it makes you kind of wonder what effect the racial composition of the jury had on that, on that case. It wasn't a case where the Commonwealth had slam dunk evidence or it was a he said, she said. You know, the brother had one version of events and my client had another version of events. 
Yeah. And that was really, really disturbing. And his, he's been fighting that for years. He was just denied in federal court um, last year. So this man has been sentenced to uh, life in prison. And that's the trial that he had. So I would like to say that things have changed. I think that, that the court administration has made an effort, uh, but that was back in the early 2000s that the effort was made very, very recently. Um, and I can't, it, it's within the last five years, I had a similar situation. And so this is 15 years later, I had a yeah. death penalty case and I walked into the room and this was, I, it wasn't the first day of jury selection. I think it was actually the second day of jury selection. And it was once again, they called the panel of 35 people that we were to choose from. And it was a sea of white people. There was not a single African-American person on that jury panel. And my client was black. And so I said, we have to see the judge and we, and everybody knew what it was about. Um, so we went up to see the judge and I made the same arguments that I've been making, you know, for 30 years. And this judge actually said, okay, um, are there any people of color in the room? And they said, yes, there are, you know, there are some black people in the room that, that you could choose from. And he said, okay, we'll make sure that they're in the panel, but he wasn't explicit in his instructions about how that was to happen. Mm -hmm. So he, we were up in the courtroom deciding, you know, what we were going to do next. And he made the call down to the jury room to tell them to include African-American people in the jury panel. And this is like, sometimes I think I'm a, I've become some sort of horrible person because sometimes when things are so horrible, I find them amusing. I, mean, I think you have to laugh or you'll cry. But we went back down to the jury room and the method that they had chosen to cure the lack of black people on the jury panel was to put folding chairs at the end of each row. So if there are five rows of seven, they put a folding chair on the end of each row and moved a black person into each one of those folding chairs. Oh and it was actually God. so <laughs> horrible that Ugh. like I didn't, I got five steps into the room and like turned around and said, we need to go back up. So it was an outrageous uh, way of sort of curing the problem. And what happened was all of the arguments and all of the missteps led to the prosecution saying, we just have, we're gonna withdraw the death penalty. We're not seeking the death penalty anymore. This has become, you know, it's a, tr to use a legal term, a shit show. So, you know, we were withdrawing our notice of intention to seek death. Yeah. So the, the, the problem still continues. You know, we, there's so many lists that we could use to summon people for jury duty that um, we don't use. You know, you could use unemployment roles or unemployed lists of people who are in unemployment. You could use income tax or, you know, local property tax roles, although that wouldn't be something that I think would be particularly productive. But you could use public assistance, you know, there's nothing in the law that says the list has to be only driver's license and voter registration. Right. So, but that's something that the, the legislature and Supreme Court need to work on. Um, cell phone subscriber lists, you might get a more um, diverse group of people if you use lists that contain more diverse people. Just more representative of who lives in Allegheny County. Right. And when we made the, all these arguments, we used the census results yeah. and said, you know, it's 14% black in Allegheny County. The jury pools that we pick from should be 14% black. There wasn't, any, the argument wasn't even being made that the jury needed to be, but the, right, the pool, yeah, I understand. From needs to be. Yeah. So that was, um, those were just a couple of cases where the racial makeup was, of the jury was just blatantly incorrect. But, and some people say, well, why does that matter? I mean, wouldn't you just be fine picking the first 12 or 14 people that, you know, fit the criteria? But 
you know, and, it, and it's funny because I, I ran for district attorney in 2019 and I'm not a politically oriented person. I don't really like the political process. And I said to the people that I'd hired for my campaign manager, like, why aren't we going out there trying to find people that might not agree with me and convince them, you know, that my, what I would, my proposals and what I want to do are right and get them to vote for me. And they said, that's not how elections work. They said, what you do is you find your like-minded people and then you make sure that they get to the polls to vote for you. So you're not trying to convince people who don't agree with you to vote for you. You're trying to locate the people who do and get them out to vote. And it was funny because I thought that's what jury selection is really. I mean, you might have a good case and you, you're going to want to make an argument, but you're going to look for people that you think that will be receptive to your arguments and get them on the jury. So it's a lot like the political process, I guess. You're, you're, you're seeking out people that you think will be interested in the themes or the um, facts that you have on your side. And that's so important in death penalty cases, so important. There's a, there's a group of people out in Colorado um, that did a lot of research on juries, jury selections, interviewed jurors after death penalty cases, and they actually developed this method of jury selection, which is kind of intuitive for the people that do the work, but usually you don't want juries to know horrible things about your client, right? You want them to... <laughs> Like, I mean, there's a bias thing that I guess we're concerned about there, right? Yeah, I mean, you you don't have to go to law school to know that, like, really kind of want the jury to think my client's a good guy who's in a bad situation. But in a death penalty case, it's different because most of the times the prosecution has significant amount of evidence that your client is the one that committed the crime. And the real trial is the penalty. Or is this person going get, to get death or is this person going to get life? So their method of jury selection involves, and it's a little more complex than this, but it, it really involves letting the jury know up front, this is how freaking horrible this case is. If you found that he actually did all these hideous, horrible things, would you be able to consider a sentence of life? And a lot of people say, well, I could consider life and death before they've been given any facts about the case. But when you present them with, you know, something horrific, like, oh yeah, this person, you know, raped and murdered a three-year-old child and chopped their body up and put it in a blender and all this other stuff, this person who would have said, oh, I could consider both life and death for a homicide of a child. When you present it to them with the full panoply of horror, they say, oh, absolutely not. If I find that guy guilty, he's dead. So it, it, it's a method of gently, rather than the, her, the way I just did it, but gently introducing certain facts to people to determine where their real mindset is as opposed to what they like to think their mindset is. Because yeah. you, know, you know, most people wanna think they're good, fair, kind people. Yes, yeah. ideal self. Yes. Who we, yeah. who we are ideally, not who we are actually. Yeah. So I had a case that was, that sort of bore that out um, a number of years ago. It was a, a shooting at a sandwich shop. This, my client was accused along with one other guy of carrying out like a drug vendetta against another person. And this other person was actually in a wheelchair. They were wheelchair bound. And so my client supposedly and I, I've still remain unconvinced of my client's guilt, but he, um, these two fellas supposedly went into this diner and opened fire in this diner and they killed more than one person. And one of the people that they killed was a child who was there with her family. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on the sentencing part of that case. So I wasn't trying the, the factual part of the case, which was actually weak against my client, but we tried the whole case and the jury came back hung. And 
what was related to me later was that the judge brought the jury down and asked them why they were hung on the case. Mm -hmm. And they said, we had already decided that whoever committed this crime would die for it. So we wanted to be 100% sure that we had the right people before we voted for conviction. And that's not really the way the law says the decision is supposed to be made. Right. But, um, that's why you have to be really careful in jury selection because sometimes sometimes juries find those people on who were on that jury all said they could be fair in the case prior to it starting but yeah. once they actually heard what the facts were they were like we wouldn't even consider a life sentence for this, for these people yeah so it's much better to find that out after they are seated that i mean before they're seated rather than after it's an that's an interesting one because it's like they were willing to go to the ends of it, but they wouldn't go to the ends of it unless they were certain was right. the right. And so it's in, it's a not to say it's really interesting, but it's almost well, like you're... that is what you I mean, that's I would say like as an outsider to the law or whatever, as a bystander of this, that's what I would want is somebody who would only, I don't believe in the death penalty personally. I think there's too much, you know, corruption and racism built into that situation. But if I believed in the death penalty, I suppose that's the, you want to be certain of, of such a final consequence. Well, it's funny because jurors didn't have to be certain and they still don't according to the law. But I think because of what we've come to find out in the last you know, 25 years about how the death penalty is applied and how yeah. decisions are made to ask for it, the courts now allow defense counsel a lot more leeway in terms of saying, talking about residual doubt, which is what we call that little bit of space between proof beyond a reasonable doubt and proof beyond all doubt. Because to prove, you know, to convict somebody of a crime, you just have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's suggested, and I think it's 100% fair that before you impose a death sentence, you have to be convinced beyond all doubt. Mm -hmm. So some... I don't think I've been successful yet. I've written my own jury instruction for how to use residual doubt and I file it in every case. Um, I've yet to have a judge say, I'm actually going to give that instruction, but they do allow us to argue that you can and absolutely have the right to insist on 100% certainty before you vote for the death penalty. Yeah. So when you were talking earlier about jury selection and that process and the you know, it's really the legislature that would need to make amendments to look at that process being changed. Do you see that as that happening in other states? Do you find, I mean, you talked about Oregon and like research that's happening there. Is there a more representative process that is happening in other places? I feel like it is not, mostly because and I have to remember, try to remember the exact wording because this, the stats, the statistics part of it, is something that I learned to argue, and since then has sort of faded off into the distance. But some yeah. people don't know it's the, the, like an absolute variance versus something else variance, and they were they were arguing about the the numbers and. It's it's not been successful many other places. The courts have not have not ever said that you're entitled to a representative veneer. You're only entitled to a represent a, a, a fair process of bringing those people in. Yeah, and that's why a lot of these challenges keep getting lost in the courts because, um, despite the fact that I think the lists are racially inequitable the process is supposed to be equitable. And is it still true? I have a question in the comments that I'll pose in a second. Is it still true that there's like language that talks about that the jury must be of one's peers? Is there something that's of, what is the language about? Because I would say that all your arguments and talking about like, you know, the veneer piece or like this racial representation, if your client is of one race that, that 
that that peer group must also be a piece of it. Is there language like that? That's there, there is, but it's jury of your peers, but that means your community. So you're not entitled to your particular peers. I'm not entitled to old white ladies on my, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so yeah, it's, it's your community. So that's why, that's kind of why we made the argument that way, which was give us what the census says Mm -hmm. our community is. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, um, a couple of comments of thanking you for being here. And then, um, so the question reads, and I'm going to answer it live. It seems like law might as much be, might be as much art as it is science involving a lot of soft people skills. So how do you think Cal U students interested in a career in law could sharpen those skills? And do you have like recommendations for like fields of study? I would guess you don't necessarily, specific courses wouldn't make sense necessarily, but like, what are some things that they could do to sharpen those skills? Well, the only problem is I think that, well, I think psychology and psychiatry would be, if you're interested in criminal law, is a great, are the great fields because there are, there is a lot of, uh, as we recognize how much mental illness and addiction and trauma have to do with being the genesis of crime, yeah, behavior, um, those fields become much more involved in in what we do there are because i do i can tell you in a death penalty case i'm always got at least a psychiatrist and a psychologist um in sentencing we have social workers and most frequently i use psychologists to try to explain to a judge or to a a jury in a death penalty case you know how this person came to have committed this heinous crime so they're really good fields Honestly, I was a history major because I was told the law is a lot of reading and writing and figuring out cause and effect and analyzing text. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good field. The only problem is that's a really hard field. If you decide you don't want to be a lawyer, what are you going to do with your history degree? (laughs) (laughs) There are avenues. (laughs) (laughs) a lot of other applied things certainly a a background to a a later um what i want to say like applied field but i i hear what you're saying the history is you know in and of itself the study really of gathering information right and it's it's interesting because like i would have said I chose history because I was told to read and write and it seems like it might be sort of fun and interesting. But legal, when you go to law school, and I think the whole point of law school is to teach you how to do legal research because yeah. it's very, this is the super boring part of being a lawyer. Some of us find it fascinating, but if you're not a lawyer, it's a big yawn. There are, say there's a statute that says, you know, such and such is a crime and here are the elements of the crime, A, B, and C, you know, it, um, like murder, you, someone is dead, the, the defendant has killed them and they did so with malice, right? Mm-hmm. So your job is to convince a judge to throw the case out because they can't prove malice. Well, how do you do that? You read old cases because right. the legislature writes that law, but then courts interpret the law. So your job as a lawyer is to go back and find cases that are analogous to the one that you're in so that you can argue that it's so similar that the judge has to do the same thing that the court did in that past case. So when I started, I am pre-internet lawyer. Yes. (laughs) We actually had (laughs) books. Yeah, books. And so when you see old movies with lawyers, um, in them and they show their offices. They, yes, they, the books. Yeah. Our baskets, Lisa. They had books behind them. <laughs> right. There are basket, and my baskets are full of like computer garbage and files. And, <laughs> but they had books because that's where you had to look everything up. And I tell you what, as much as we can romanticize books, it's a lot easier to type in a search on the computer and bingo, yeah. you know, their list of cases. But oh, I've forgotten now why I went on that tangent just talking about law school. So history is yeah. history, studying history to try to found cause and effect for um, 
various incidents that may have occurred is a good training for going back and trying to say, okay, the judge, the court found such and such a way in this old case. Let me dissect the three reasons. Sure. They, but I'd say too, even probably I'm going to guess that in your history education, you learned a lot about like at least legislation that was at the federal government level, right? About a lot of things, perhaps like Chinese Exclusion Act or different like um, executive orders and their impact on different populations throughout, right? Like our history, at least, I mean, in my social work classes, that's something I definitely bring to bear in these conversations about like equity and justice and social justice. Right. Well, I, I, to that or something. I don't know. I actually was able to take a class, and I still remember it because I loved the class. It was a small seminar, and was one of the few classes I actually attended in my, you know, senior year. Of college. <laughs> <laughs> but we we were talking about the Canadian legal system versus the American legal system, and one thing that was really interesting, and I ended up writing a paper on it, was. You know, in the United States, if there's a bad search, like say the cops violate your your um, Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure, you the prosecution can't use the evidence against you. Right. In Canada, they can use it, but you have a cause of action against the police. So you back then, I haven't researched the law since then, but so here the prosecution doesn't get to convict you of a crime in canada they can still convict you of a crime but you can sue the police officer for violating your rights it's interesting that was really interesting to me yeah so the government basically can if they're willing to pay enough for it they could you know get their criminal conviction in illegal meat in an illegal um, method yeah so basically, students who are listening, it sounds like the majors that engage you in reading, writing, preparing yourself, because there's a lot of, le I mean, legal writing is also a very specific format and sort of like methodology to how one writes. So I'd say the more comfortable one is in those writing skills, the more easily they're able to be molded in those years of law school into that legal writing process but you have to be comfortable reading language that like Lisa was saying not to say it's a big yawn but it's not like this is like a captivating story it's like very factual yes in, in right. the way it's presented and sometimes it's very technical you know particularly in um like civil cases where they're talking about boring stuff and <laughs> it's, it's technical. You know, my field, criminal law is always, almost always exciting. There are, there are areas that you can argue that you can go into deep holes of history. And if you read a lot of Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court cases, particularly by those judges that are strict constructionist people who wanna talk about the way things were in 1776 and that's how we should be or 18 you know 86 this is how we should interpret laws now they do go back and give the historical all the way back to you know common law yeah so being able if you want to be that type of because obviously there are all types of lawyers right you if you right. want to do patent law you should probably take more technical engineering classes if you sure. want to do right if you want to do um, medical malpractice, you might want to take more science classes. I don't think you can truly prepare because I don't know how many people know what they want to do in, in college in terms of future. If you know 100%, you should take those types of classes that will prepare you for that. Yeah. I think too, you know, I, I think that the most, you know, from the attorneys that I know and, in, you know, speaking with you, Lisa, the the tenacity to to be ready to do the research and write. So those really like critical reading, writing skills, I think in that that's something that's like, not to be like, it brings you joy, but it brings you purpose. Absolutely. Right, is a critical, I think, driving point for attorneys who stand the test of time in their chosen field of expertise. Right, so, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. So I'm in trial you know, arguing and, and trying to convince a jury of a judge that my side is right. There are so many people that don't go to trial. Yeah. You, you know, appellate attorneys, civil people don't go to trial that much. 
Um, you go to trial a lot in the family division or juvenile court, but you know, there are a lot of options for people who don't want to sing and dance and, and you know, be dramatic in front of a jury. So reading and writing analytical skills are super important. Yeah. When I was in law in college, which that was in the 80s, everybody who wanted to go to law school took public policy. Mm -hmm. Because that was, and that was, I don't know what public policy classes are now, but we did a lot of those chart, like flow charts, decision charts. Yeah. Yeah. I dropped that major real quick. But <laughs> Well, so on the topic of like jury selection or what, what would you like to see? We've talked a little bit about some of the issues that what changes or what things would you like to see, Lisa, like move in one direction or another in terms of bringing more um, participation from communities of color or, right? Because I mean, talking about like, we need to expand how one pulls in that pool of individuals. What are, you know, what are practical things that you could see people like even getting behind in terms of a campaign because I know there's a lot after the Black Lives Matter movement really got a lot more um, interest convergence, especially from individuals who identify as white this past summer, you know, participating in that movement and really seeking to be allies and be a part of addressing equity issues. I'm wondering if there are things that like students could do or advocate for, right? Like what could students do to start engaging themselves in addressing that? trying to I'm trying to think where I think public pressure and just writing about it talking to um, those who have influence in terms of the county government because you know there are things that can be done we can uh, in each county determines what their what lists they use you know I was looking and I don't have it in front of me or um, up right now but you know, most counties use two lists. There was one county that had like seven lists. I think another county had 12 lists. We can expand the lists. Mm -hmm. We also, I think, and this is something that, you know, court administration doesn't always want to talk about because they're more number cruncher people, but we have disenfranchised black people, poor people, people who struggle, you know, we have discriminated against them so incredibly in our criminal legal system yeah. that we have eroded any trust that they might've had that the system is fair to them or works for them or includes right. them. So I think in order to ask, ask people to participate, uh, we're asking a lot to ask people to participate yes. in the process that screws them at every right. juncture. That's so, I think, true. you know, one of the first and most important things that we need to do is to figure out ways to assure the public that the system is going to try very hard to make changes for greater fairness and greater equity for all people. Um, the only way to really do that, I think, is to involve the communities that are most affected by the legal system into the legal system and into the de decision-making process. So traditionally judges have been very standoffish and have not engaged with the community. Like that's one of the, I think most important things is that if you are elected to be a judge, you need to speak to people that are in communities that you don't necessarily live in or participate in. And I think that judges need to engage community members in terms of innovative and new ways to sentence people if you're going yeah. to sentence them. So, you know, I was talking to an attorney who does a lot of work in the juvenile division and she was saying that because judges maybe aren't as familiar with all the different programs that are available out in the community, they'll accept a recommendation of a probation officer about where a kid should be placed for treatment or where they should attend treatment. So you might give a, you might have a kid who's, who's from Allentown, like having to come all the way over to the Hill District for some sort of programming. Yeah. Well, that child's not gonna be successful because they can't get from here to there. Right. Um, whereas there are people in the South Side and the Slopes in, in Allentown and, and Beltsuver 
community people who are very interested in providing support and treatment for children in their communities and children will be more successful. So the bottom yeah. line is we have to start involving community members in the decision-making process. Yeah. You know, I was filling out one of those, you know, one of the questionnaires that um, you have to fill out for a lot of different endorsements. And I've really actually enjoyed that process because I've had a really long career and sometimes the questions make you think back on. Yeah. You know, but I was, um, I was just doing research and I came across some American Bar Association um, paper and it talked about the role of the courts in terms of shaping the community, shaping the discourse of the country. And I guess I never would have thought of courts as that important or judges as that important, but they're one of the great institutions, you know, like schools mm -hmm. that, that reflect or should, should reflect the community, the, the voice of the community. And I don't, I think they're reflecting, they're currently reflecting their own views and their own um, assessments. We need much more community involvement in the courts in order for the system to be fair and for other people to want to participate. If I were black and I saw the uh, the use of bail algorithms to deny black people bail while giving white people bail, I wouldn't want yeah. to participate. You know, if I saw right. if I saw the disparities in sentencing for a white kid who comes in with the crime versus a black kid, I wouldn't want to participate. I would say right. you're you know. Well, I think that's why so many are not participating, right? I think that is why there's the the situation that we're in now. And I think it's, you know, this, the idea of white people being in Black Lives Matter or trying to be a part of things is like, not to be like it's relatively new, but I think this idea of civil rights being like a renewed call to action and how does that, how does this work not then ask everybody who is of color to be like, no, well now you all need to do this work because it's your community, right? Like how does, there's like a balance there that I think some communities are maybe a little bit more further along in what that co collaboration really looks like. And I did have a couple of um, questions from attendees. One person asked you about um, eliminating cash bail or if that's something that could happen here given that it's happened in some other states like Illinois. Well, I just want to say one more thing about yeah. You know, it would be nice if the judges would hire people of color as their staff. Yeah. It would be nice if the county hired, you know, minute clerks who are the people that sit down in front of the judge who are people of color, you know, yeah. it, and we need to have more black judges, quite honestly. Yeah. So anyway, cash yeah. bail is almost not a thing in Allegheny County anymore. And I'll tell you why, because there was a... The person that initially sets bail is a magistrate. That's the person who does the preliminary arraignment and sets bail. There's been a great push to have magistrates not set cash bail. There are some that still do. Um, however, the Court of Common Pleas, Judge Manning was doing um, motions court. He basically and he reviews bail decisions. So if a magistrate sets a cash bail and you can't make it, you can ask for a judge to review that decision, a common police court judge to review that decision. He would not set cash bails. Every bail was either release, release with conditions or no release at all, denied bail. And the real folks that can make the most impact on ending cash bail are your local magistrates. Mm -hmm. Because common police court judges it takes sometimes three days for, for a bail review to get to them. So by the time an individual um, is, has a cash bail set for them and asked for it to be reviewed, they've already lost their job because they haven't shown up for three days. Yeah. You know, or they've lost their housing or their dog is dead in their house because nobody's home. You know, so we need to reduce the time than it takes to get the review in front of the judge. And another thing that I think would be very helpful in terms of bail is to eliminate the use of those algorithms that I talked about. You know, it's funny because sometimes the things that are supposed to make things more fair end up not making them more fair. So 
bail, they, bail ag algorithms were really used um, or have been used so that the human element is taken out of you know, deciding what the bail should be. The only problem is that the, so it's a number of factors that are used to determine what a person's risk of not appearing for court is or what their risk of continued danger is. But and it takes into account things like prior arrests, um, the, the crime that's charged, um, where you live, but mm. one of, some of the things that it doesn't take into account, and to me, this is an incredibly important, like, do you work? Are you employed? Yeah. And some of the, like to, to look at somebody's arrest history is, you know, racially biased because yeah. it's a well-known fact that neighborhoods of color are more heavily policed and therefore yes. they would have more arrests. Um, they don't look at why you might not have appeared for a prior hearing. So the use of bail algorithms, as far as I'm concerned, is, is a bad choice. Yes, and it, I, I think the point you made that you create an algorithm to try to remove the bias, but yet the algorithm itself is inherently inclusive of the bias is one of these like the shadow ways in which we've kept a lot of these things going all this this period of time. Right. There's a lot of that, and I think in our society in a, in a multitude of different ways, including, you know, apparently in that. I have one other question from a student, and I'm not sure if you'll have an answer for this one, Lisa, but um, it's a student who says, I would like to be a JAG um, judge advocate for the general corps officer. Do you know, or could you shed any light on what that would be like? Or what that, what is that? What should they want to be a JAG officer? What is that? What does it mean to get there? What is that? Oh, I don't know much about the military um, and how you would become, you know, a military um, lawyer. I think it's, um, I think it's a lot like being a criminal defense lawyer, honestly. You know, it's not all, What's that? What's the movie with uh... Top Gun? I don't know. <laughs> These are all movies I haven't watched. I like have three kids and movies are not a watched a movie in like a decade, basically. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Probably. Where Jack Nicholson says you, some, like yells. Well, you can't handle the truth. That one? Yeah. yeah. No, you can't handle the truth. It's not all like that. I think a lot of what the military um, lawyers do is stupid crimes that occur on bases. On base. and, yeah. So basically really preparing yourself to, I mean, you're going to law school, but probably also you have to be enrolled in the military. So there's like the dualism of, of right. these sort of things like enlistment and the right career preparation piece. Yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot of people who are JAG, you know, lawyers. Well, thank you for taking a stab at it. I mean, you sure. know, we'll throw the questions out there. We'll, we'll answer them or not competently. That's yeah. all right. Um, are there any other things that you'd like to, we're nearing the end of our time. Is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of sort of insights or directions or just things you thought about that you wanted to share in this forum? I just hope that, you know, traditionally we need to change the, the, the people that are in power in the legal system and we need to change the focus of the legal system. You know, in terms of the criminal division where I spend a lot of time, people see a criminal case as something to resolve and get a verdict and be done. But what we found is that getting a verdict doesn't always mean resolving a, conf a conflict or resolving a problem. So I think the focus needs to be less on getting to court and, you know, fighting in court and more on providing people with the supports and the help that they need so we don't get to court. You know, yeah. we have so many people locked up in the Allegheny County Jail who suffer from mental health problems and addiction problems. 75% of the people in there have either a mental health problem or a problem with addiction and 50% of those people have both. Um, so the focus needs to be on treatment and rehabilitation and community support rather than a more police, so we can arrest more people and attempt to punish them out of issues that punishment has nothing to do with. Yeah. So, I yeah, mean, I, the deeply punitive nature of our culture is a very hard undoing. And I think 
again, it feels like there are pockets of places that have started to try to address some of these things, especially with like, um, you know, police or public safety forces being a broader spectrum of people, including, you know, mental health, not just like a resolve crisis network, right, but like people who are like, you know, um, integrated into those forces and are engaging with the community on a regular basis. But it's almost, and I, it's these challenges during COVID times too, I'm sure like it's added a new layer to things. And I wonder what will be built up or built out after we come back to a place of like seeing each other in the real world again. Well, you know, just to segue from that, from what you just said, there's a program in Denver called the star program that, Mm -hmm. If in six months they hand they they send out instead of sending a police officer to certain calls they send a clinician and a medic. Yeah, and they did something like seven hundred and fifty calls in six months. None of them resulted in an arrest. Right. So if you send people the right, um, well, the word escapes support. Mid- <laughs> yes, yeah, so right, yeah. the right things that they need. You don't yeah. have to involve the legal system at all, and it'd be nice yeah. to get to a place like that. We'll all be safer that way. Yeah. I think that's sometimes the hard part for people to see because people are so isolated in their communities. Their experience of what is threat to them is really from the news media. And I still just find that there's such deep bias in all of that when it comes to, I was just thinking about this morning with the Tiger Woods story, how there was like a press release this morning that there was no drug or alcohol in Tiger Woods' system. Now, if Tiger Woods was a white guy, do you think that that would have been a lead story on NPR this morning? I have to say no. And that that's a part of like a narrative again, that there has to be, you know, it couldn't just be an accident. Right. Well, or you- that something physically happened to him. He had to be using drugs or alcohol. And we want all the white people out there who, observe, you know, listen to NPR to know Tiger's not guilty of any wrongdoing or like, right. It's just this, there's constantly narratives like this. Yeah. Well, it's, and you see it in the reporting of like people that are shot by the police. You know, if it's a black person that's shot by the police, we get a rundown on their criminal history and right. you know, how they didn't take their garbage out on Thursdays. But you know, if it's some, a, a white person who's shot by the police, they were a good kid and nobody understands how this happened. So yeah. we, we, we have a lot of work to do. I think we have a, 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 lot, a lot of, of work. work and a lot of work. thankfully, you know, there are people who are willing to do the work. Well, I think Allegheny County, especially, especially is very lucky to have somebody like you, Lisa, who's dedicated themselves to pursuing, a, you know, different avenues to try to address these injustices and, is, you know, seek different ways to you know, um, engage in from different angles to like support communities that have been, you know, really destroyed and wronged by the way that the the justice system works at this point in time. And it's, you know, it, it takes all of us to be committed to that kind of work. And I think, I'm sure you've seen it in the legal world that people might start in the, you know, public defender's office, but they go on to, you know, high paying other illustrious avenues of the law. And it's hard to keep good people in the work that is not highly paid it's like teachers it's like so many different avenues and I think you know somebody like you who's dedicated themselves to that I think you know you're kind of a stalwart of like what's so important about um, our ethical and moral obligations to our society and how you know so many of us put ourselves in a public arena to to make sure that that's the message that we're sending that this is what's important is the taking care of one another and doing the things that we can do in our lives Mm -hmm. to make a difference I'm trying. Plug it away. <laughs> so are we all. Over here, Cal, you too. Plugging away in my virtual world. <laughs> well, thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. And um, we'll send out this um, YouTube link. And somebody's asking me, yes, will there be a, this webinar was recorded? It was recorded. It's also on the um, our Cal U YouTube channel uh, for all time. So students can access it there. So Um, that link will be sent out to all um, chairs of departments. So hopefully they can push that out to students in those departments. Yeah, and you can share my email if anybody has any um, questions or, you know, wants to come see a trial when we actually have them. Although we just had the judicial emergency extended again, I think through June. So no in-person trials. Yeah. 
But there is a court watch. The Abolitionist Law Center has a program to train to be a court watcher. If you're interested, look them up. Can you say what that's called again? Court watch? It's called court watch and you can train with them and then they will help you get access to various courtrooms where we're doing virtual hearings or virtual pleas. And it's really a good thing to know because when you're when you're on doing all things virtually, yeah. the general public doesn't know what's happening. Right. So it's always good to have the public, always good to have the public viewing what goes on in courtrooms to make sure that things are fair. Yeah, definitely. That's great. So, yeah, it's the Abolitionist Law Center, I believe. You can reach out to them to get involved in their court watch program. Thanks again, Lisa. We really appreciate your time and your expertise and you're taking your time to talk to CalU's faculty, staff, and students today. Thank you. Okay. All right.